I was very excited because the room is called Fairlight and uh, I used to be in the demo and in the cracking scene in, when I was a teenager. So I wanted to share some of the things that we did back then and how they actually relate to what we're doing now in IT and what we're doing in the market. So this was the kind of stuff that you saw with Fairlight back then. You got a game and you had this intro in front of it and it always fascinated me why that was and why would people put an effort into it, do something illegal and then put their name on it. You know, it's not politicians, it's just, it's just normal people doing it. So when I grew up as a teenager, this was the Apple Watch. This was the thing that everybody wanted to have and only the rich people could afford, or the rich kids could afford. Me as being the son of a coal miner and a housewife and having three siblings, I didn't have one and I couldn't afford one because I would have to fight my parents for time in front of the television set because they didn't come with a monitor. They needed a TV to connect to. So I was always going, in school we had one, we had a lot of PETs next to it, like terrible uh, green screen computers, and we had to find time for that one as well. But that didn't stop me playing with them, because I was always a kid that was fascinated by computers. I would look, stay up late at night and watch like computer animations on uh, about the Ars Electronica in like Brazil 1982 and things like that. And my parents were always fascinated by that, like, why do you like computers? And I'm like, because I hate math. And computers do math for us. Because I don't think there's a point that a human should do a, re a repetitive thing when a computer can do a loop for that. So I started writing BASIC and I was so awesome at it. It was just incredible. That was one of the things like when you say, okay, you run the program, what's your name? Chris, you are cool. And then you run the program, what's your name? Tom, you're not, you aren't cool. And that's how I showed my friend Tom who the better programmer is. And he was devastated and it was just amazing. But uh, it got really boring really quickly because BASIC is a very strange language. And one time I cycled to school and I found this on the, side, on the bicycle track. Uh, it was basically a floppy disk. These were the floppy disks back then, even before the three and a half ones that looked like a 3D printed safe icon. And this one was on the bicycle track and I stopped and there was even a tire mark over it. And I was like, okay, well, this is cool. Like now I've got a floppy disk. There's something on a Commodore 64 on that one. Now I've got to find a way to look at that. School was, was closed, so I went into one of those shops back then, Quelle, German shop, that actually allowed you to play with the computers in there. That doesn't happen nowadays any longer. And I put the floppy disk in and I started, there's a game on there. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. Let's play the game and started playing it. And it was Ghosts and Goblins and this is what it looked like. It was like this little thing where you shot at people and uh, you, it was a really cool game. But I was so bad at it. I, did it, I tried it a few times, but I'm terrible at computer games, and the first thing I do is normally complain that the game was badly written, probably, because it can't be me that makes a mistake, right? It has to be somebody else's fault. But um, I, I had that for a few weeks, and whenever I went there, and after school, I just played the game in that shop, and strangely enough, they didn't kick me out. I guess they didn't want to argue with a redhead. But then this guy comes up to me, uh, another kid, and he's like, do you know that there's a trick with that one? I'm like, what do you mean? And he typed in, he, he cleared the screen before he loaded, the, he loaded the game, he cleared the screen, he typed in TCS, and then he ran the game, and out of a sudden I had endless lives. My lives were not going away anymore, and I was like, this is magic. <laughs> you know, what the hell is going on there? And he's like, well, it's been cracked by the guys at TCS, and that's the way how you turn on the endless lives. And I was thinking these cracker guys must be something really <laughs> special, you know? Must be these really geniuses that sit in the corner and do something amazing with it. And then I, uh, uh, my, my dad got me a job with one of his friends doing bricklaying and cleaning up construction sites. So I made some money and I bought myself my first Commodore 64 and I started playing with it and had my own games and it worked out. And then everything changed because the action replay came out. And then I realized, ah, now I know what these people have done. The action replay was a cartridge that you put in the back of the computer and you can press a button and it takes a screenshot of the memory and allows you to mess around with the memory. So you can actually analyze what happens inside the computer right now and you can change the code around, you can delete images and these kind of things. Much like we are so used to now with, with multi-threaded computers that do multitasking. But back then, when the memory was full, the computer was full. There was nothing else to do. So you had two chips that allowed you to have take a copy of the main computer and the other chip was the functionality of the cartridge itself. So I could now mess with the code and I'm like, aha, now I know I'm going to find out what's going on. And it was actually pretty simple. All I had to do is freeze the game, start editing the screen, and find out where the counter of the lives are. 
So the, the screen memory was from 0, uh, 077 to uh, 0400 to 0500. And I just went through it and I'm like, okay, that's the counter. So if I lose a life, that changes. So then I hunted through the memory for uh, CE 10004, which means decrement um, 040410, which means I left a life, and then analyzed the code that pointed to that one. All I had to do is override it with an EAEAEA, nop, 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 and out of a sudden I had endless lives and that was amazing. So all it was was trying to find out something happened on the screen, where did that change come from, make sure that change doesn't happen anymore. That was all the magic that was to that. Well, sometimes there was like a few loops, so they were hidden, hiding it somewhere else, but it was not that hard. And the door was open, and I took one step at a time exploring. I was like, this is so amazing. I want to know how they've done that. I want to know how they've done that. I know now how the game, how the lives get counted down, but I didn't know how you die. I didn't know how the thing moves. So I learned more my programming on that machine by analyzing games and doing random stuff with it because my own code was boring. I didn't, people didn't care, but people were excited when I managed to get them endless lives in their games. So that was much more exciting for them. And then I started enhancing my skills about this. What was the next thing? Level skipper. So instead of having to play through the whole level, you can go to the next level. Uh, weapons chooser, because there's different weapons in the game and some of them were terrible to use. So I just say, wrote a thing that we pressed F3 and you can switch through the weapons. Toggle sprite collision, making sure that you can actually run through a level without crashing into enemies and dying if you get stuck in a certain part of the game. And uh, it was because the Commodore 64 had eight hardware sprites, which were the movable things that were independent of the rest of the screen being painted. So you all, had, you all had one collection where it actually did the clashing, so you just overwrote that and then you were invincible, so to say. And then I learned assembly language because I made so many things and I didn't want to explain it with people with clearing the screen and typing my name in or something, but I want to start the game and then like, do you want endless lives, do you want weapons chooser and so on and so forth. So I started learning assembly language with a big book because the internet didn't exist yet and I started my writing my trainer menu. And then I had to find space in the mem in memory for set menu because most games used up the 64K and that was all you had completely. So I had to find a way to pack the game and then put a memory, uh, put the intro on there and these kind of things. And then I started releasing it. I learned about packers to create a smaller version and I added an intro to both to show like, hey, that was me doing it. And of course I had a different name because I didn't want the police to come. And I give it to people. And of course, back then, I was giving it in school to other people on a floppy disk, like in a dark corner, like, oh, there you go. <laughs> you know? And uh, then, I, up, then I, I got into this world where many, many people did this. Like, one of the kids that showed me that trainer was also part of another group, of another release group. And he's like, oh, I'm, 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 I'm as cool as you are, and I'm better than you are. And uh, then it was copy protections. A lot of games, like the first game, when somebody came to the shop and put the floppy disk there and said, like, this is a pirated copy not to be played by it publicly or not to be done. And all it was just overriding that string so it doesn't show up. <laughs> like, you had just had to find it in memory. They did a few, like, they, they deleted a few tracks on the floppy disk, so you had to make sure if you copied them that you also killed them afterwards again. But it was very simple. Level crunchers and packers, so if the game had le different levels, a lot of companies didn't pack those levels, so they ended up with like five floppy disks where one of them would have been enough. Uh, fast loaders, a lot of them took like 20 minutes to load a level in between, so we wrote loading routines to talk to the hardware, so I started understanding what the floppy hardware was about or the, the tape deck hardware was about. So that's all the research that you never need again, but then, back then that was all we had. And then uh, Hacker News nowadays is where we compete with each other, who's got the coolest JavaScript library of the day. And back then we had the same, t the same things, in the scene, so to say, it was called. There was the Gamer's Guide by Triad, and there was the uh, Sex and Crime, it was called, strangely enough, by Amok. And that one released every month which games have been changed by people, how many trainers they have, like how many extra lives you can get, uh, if, they're, if they're working perfectly. And it was a massive competition for no money whatsoever, but people got really excited about competing with each other. And the competition was about like the first release, who was the first one to get the new game out, who was the one that had the smallest release, which one is the best that packed the game the best, and then an NTSC and PAL fix, because the problem was that most games were built in America and then sent to Europe. In Europe, we had a different TV system than America, so it's 60 frames per second in America at 25, uh, at 25 uh, 
iterations, and it was 50 frames per second in Europe. So almost every American game flickered when you played it. So the mental thing we did back then was taking the game and rewriting every waiting routine in that game to make sure it doesn't flicker in Europe. We didn't get paid for that. We just wanted to be the cool kid that releases that one. Nowadays, we don't have that problem anymore because all screens are 60 frames per second. But back then, it was just a big problem because a lot of games didn't work. Much like when you play a game on your mobile now and the frame rate goes too low and you die because you couldn't jump in time. So, standing out from the competition was another thing then, because uh, just being fast and being, being small, we needed something else to make us even better. So we had dual versions, as we called them, which means improving the game, fixing bugs in the game, and uh, high score savers, like if the high score couldn't be saved and you just had to play the game every single time, much like connecting to Google Play or connecting to Xbox Now. Back then we wrote these things to write to the floppy disk. And writing documentation, how to actually play the game. So we did not just steal the game or remove the copy protection or gave you endless lives, but we actively improved the game because it was already there and we wanted to be better than the others. And then, of course, there was the elite, or uh, elite, or whatever you want to pronounce it. And these were the people that were the ones that were the best and the fastest, and they had access to all the tools to make that easy as well. Much like I was unable to make a game or change a game without the, uh, without the cartridge, other people had completely different tools that I never heard of. So there were packing systems that were much better than others, storage and transfer tools, like how to copy, uh, copy floppy disks really fast, cross-platform tools, because, of course, the first thing that companies realized when there was a way of cracking their games, they released games on cartridges. So you had the cartridge already in the computer, so you couldn't do the other one. So you had to use an Amiga to read the cartridge out and then change that and wire it back to the other computer. Creation tools, assemblers, pixel editors, sprite tools, and BBS and the FTP access. So BBS was the first blue, uh, 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 systems to store and send the things across the world without sending them by mail that like we did before. And then we had FTPs, but only the best of the best got access to these FTPs. And then I was getting like, this is weird, I'm getting old enough to, be, to go to jail for this kind of stuff, so I don't want to do that. So I became legit about this and I started writing tools because the things that I was missing, I was writing for myself and writing for other people and selling them to magazines and selling them to all kinds of companies. I wrote some games as well, which was quite fun because I, I did a three level protection then. So the first copy protection was really easy to crack. And then five days later, I told you, well, you weren't good enough. You thought you were, but you weren't. And Adobe did that with Photoshop as well, strangely enough. And then I coded intros and demos, and I just wanted to make, get more into the baking space. And then I moved on, because the world moved on, and of course kids had like uh, consoles, and uh, I didn't care about games much anymore, because I had a real job to work for. I worked as a radio journalist back then, because I always couldn't get shut up. So what I found with this, and I proposed that to a TED uh, conference as well, is that uh, while being illegal, uh, we also, it became an accidental archivism. Because we improved those games and cared so much for them and made them available for us, they are still around. And there is actually a, a good example for this. Cinemaware, uh, about three years ago, tried to re-release all, uh, all their original games. Like, uh, they went in nostalgia, it's now oh, cool to be on, about old games. And in the official trailer for this one, in, on YouTube, you can see in the background one of the games here, and when you, when you blow it up, it says, Cracked by Pal for um, Quartex. So they had not their original games any longer, but as, the, as all these games are on the internet now, because it, they maintained by the, by the scene, they were available still. And I talked with Douglas Crockford the other day, he was a product manager on Maniac Mansion for Lucasfilm Games. They paid a lot of money for companies to do backups of all their stuff, but when they tried to get the backups, they never existed. So there was a lot of like hand-waving there as well, like, we be, be back up your stuff. So, as we put them from floppies to BBS to FTP, they became still available and are still available today. And the original storage media is even unreadable. Those floppy disks last about 20 years. A CD lasts about 10 years, strangely enough. So the floppy disks were actually a better way of storing them, unless you bent them or it got warm. The original companies are not available any longer, and there's no official backup. So all that creative, beautiful things that people did with those computers would be lost if people hadn't taken it upon themselves illegally to do something with those games and to improve them and to make them better. And so 
what did I learn from that? I learned that from uh, uh, by caring about something and starting with something and just doing it, I could become the developer that I'm now. I'm very successful in my job. I've done it for like 20 years or something like that. Never went to university, don't have any education. In Germany, I would be probably homeless because you don't have the paper, you're not going to work like that. My parents have no idea what I did. So but that's why I wrote the books because now when people come and visit them, my mom gives them the book like, this is what my son does. He wrote a book. <laughs> Before that, nah, whatever. And I learned that nothing can hold you back when you're good at analyzing and repeating. So I analyzed why do I lose a, a, a life and how do I fix that I don't lose a life. And the same is like going on with anything out there. Everything you see on the screen came from somewhere. It's never set in stone. It always fascinates me when people put so much money into copy protection and making sure that people cannot save their stuff. As soon as it's on a screen, I can take a screenshot. I can steal your photos. Yes, you cannot protect your photos. The amount of photographers I made websites for, like, how can I go on the web and protect my pictures? The first step is your mistake. You go on the web. As soon as you do this, people can do things with your pictures because you showed it to them. So it's much more fun to explore and tweak than to get something handed to you is the other thing as well. The excitement of finding out how somebody protected the game, how somebody uh, uh, made sure that I cannot override the losing lives, how the game, the tricks that I learned how they make the game not flicker and be smooth scrolling and stuff like that was much more exciting than getting a book or a training course to do that. That's what I do with trainings, when I do workshops, you do 70% of the workshop. I just point you in the right direction when you get stuck. Because things you find out by yourself, you retain uh, about four times better than things you just hear. So working in a limited unknown environment is a wonderful challenge. I had 64K, I had a resolution of 320 by 200 pixels and I couldn't do anything about it. That doesn't mean though that I should feel limited by the environment and only work for that environment. I can use any tooling that I wanted to when I used an Amiga later on to write things for the Commodore 64. Nowadays people use their Macs to write things for it. Of course the scene is still alive, the demo scene. And the more people do this, the more best practices can be shared. Back then we had only the tools that were available for the coolest people, but nowadays it's a different story because we just share things much more because we have social media and we try to show off to each other in public rather than in a clandestine group that only a few people are allowed to be part of. So the graphical resolution of that computer was 160 by 200 pixels on a 320 by 200 pixels display. One screen white background color, three colors, eight by eight in each pixel of 16 predefined colors. So when companies see this kind of thing and saw them back then, they created things like that. That is Ultima 7, a screenshot of the game. And that's supposed to be a lady that tells me my fortune, but I'm not quite sure it really is, because I have no idea what's going on there. Now a friend of mine in Norway, Avanya Utne, with a few friends of hers, is recoding that game now. And with nowadays technologies and nowadays uh, ideas, she turned this into this. Same resolution, same amount of colors, same computer. Just a lot more effort put into it. And you also see that the resolution is kind of different. The point is that the original game was for Apple Lisa and they just converted it over to the Commodore 64. Much like people write native uh, apps on iOS and then put it on the web with the same ideas and wonder why it doesn't perform. There's also a fairground in there. This is the picture of that one, and this is the picture that she came up with. And again, it's just incredible. These things took so much more loose, not necessarily on that uh, on the projector, but the, the pixels look so much smaller because she chose the right colors next to each other, and sh it seems like she got much more into that same screen at the same resolution, and you wonder how it works out. Well, it's much better tooling. We have better pixel programs now. Uh, experience, she knows what pixels set to next to each other, Shared trickery and knowledge, a lot, of, a lot of people who did graphics told each other, oh, if you put that next to that, it looks much better. If you do that kind of rounding thing, it looks better. And a love for the platform. She cares deeply about that Commodore 64 because she has the same history as I have, and that's why she puts a lot of effort into it. And then the web started, and uh, uh, I was like, this is cool. I worked for a radio station, and I realized I can publish things worldwide without having to pay for it or sending things to a publisher in another country who then prints a book and so on and so forth. I was like, whoa, I want to be part of this. So I quit my job at the radio station, I got myself a laptop, I taught myself HTML, 
and I just started writing websites and I got a job making a few websites for companies and BMW came to me because it was like 1998 or something. Oh, you know HTML, here's lots of money, please build our intranet because there was one of the few people doing it. And the web was to me exactly the same thing. Something is cool on the web, I do a view source to see how it's been done. A big part of my success, the web, was using view source and reverse engineering what other people have done. And don't let anybody tell you that they did otherwise, because we all started this way back then. It was the only thing we had. There was no documentation. There was no stack, stack overflow. There was no MDN even. We just had to basically see, like, whoa, this animates. How do you do that? Okay, let's look at the JavaScript source. Let's look at the CSS source. Well, CSS wasn't really available. And see what people have been doing. The lack of distance between creation and consumption was really down my alley. I love that I write something, I save it, I open it in my browser, and it's there. I don't have to go through a build script, I don't have to do some compilation that I had to do in other languages, like with assembly language. I was like, I change it, it's there. Amazing. This is cool. And then tools came around, but they were crap. They were really not good at the beginning. Crawlers, link checkers to make sure you have no dead link on your page, HTML validators, because whenever you had something displaying wrongly in Netscape 4 or Internet Explorer 5, probably it was an HTML error and the browser tried to fix it for you and you just complained that HTML is broken because you made a mistake. Web development toolbars where you can turn off images and stuff like that, HTTP proxies and sniffers. So that was good to see uh, if there's some problem in your connection or why, why your machine is slow. It's also really good to, uh, to win Flash games. A lot of games that competitions online back then had in the background just a, a, a URL, a REST URL. So you just uh, had the HTTP sniffer on, you found that out, you gave yourself 6 million points, you won the game. That's amazing how people did not protect their stuff because they put it in Flash. Yeah, nobody's going to can do view source, but you can still see the HTTP. Venkman was the debugger from Mozilla, front page express JavaScript debugger was something that Douglas Crockford used for years as well. And then everything changed when Firebug came around and we had real development tooling in the browser. And I was like, amazing. Now I can do all the stuff that I was reminding. Again, see it, change it, see what happens. Amazing, instead of having to do it. And then we got the uh, view source plus five high score saver, 100% tool version in developer tools nowadays. This is Firefox here. Uh, Chrome has, of course, amazing ones as well. The F12 toolbars in Microsoft Edge are getting better and better. Opera had, uh, I don't know if Opera still actually maintains their own one or if they use the Chrome ones. They use the Chrome ones because they have Blink now. The Chrome ones are getting super complex. You might as well just start reading books about the development tools. Uh, but we have full insight into what we're doing and there's no excuse to say, I don't know why that happened. Because you've got JavaScript debugging, you've got CSS rendering, performance kind of things. You can see what the browser is doing in every part of, uh, part of the conversation. So developer tools have replaced view source, and uh, it makes sense because they also pretty print your code in case you have it minified. You can read it in the, in the developer tools much better. We have incredible insight into what our code does in the browser, and of course not everybody is ready for this. Because we share development hardcore tools with the end users out there, and I love that uh, when I found that the other day. My Facebook suddenly split in half and this screen popped up with all these random cyberspace options and I was like watching and assessing things so weird. And talking about child and children being forced, so the error message actually <laughs> says that uh, XML box for div element contained inline span child forcing all his children to be wrapped in a block. <laughs> Is this some sort of cyber police thing that my IP was accidentally followed to access so I could help stop child abuse on the net or am I going crazy? Has this happened to anybody else? So I did the command shift K which opens the developer tools in Firefox. How you get randomly to that key, keynote shortcut, I don't know. But I love actually that that person is not only confused by it, but he makes it active. Like this is obviously the cyber police reaching out to me to help protect children on the internet. And it's just wonderful to see, but it, uh, it's just, of course, it's not for everybody. So we always push technology into normal end users' faces the same way we expect people to maintain CSS to maintain a text. No, it's not for everybody. I think it's a time that we start thinking about this is for us and this is for the, our consumers. The best part about development tools and uh, the web in, in general is that you don't have to be part of that inner circle like we had to be in the cracking scene. Our tooling is free and open. All of those are available on GitHub. All of those are available for you to give feedback to. All of them want feedback. 
and not just saying like, oh, the other one makes it so much better, why don't you do that? But actually, I need this tool, it's broken this way, and people would fix it for you. A lot of it is across platforms and gives remote access to other devices. You can, with the developer edition of Firefox, you can remotely debug over wireless, I think now, like iPads and iPhones. Vorlon.js is a library that we just released that allows you to debug 40, up to 45 different devices with WebSockets and I.O. Uh, with WebSockets and yeah, IOJS. And it's really interesting that, that even that is much easier nowadays than just buying all the machines and connecting them and, and debugging on the device, which is never fun. You can use the web, you can use virtualization and cloud-based machines to test for all kinds of issues. If you want to test, for example, Microsoft Edge, but you don't want to have Windows, like I'm using a Mac, there's Remote IE, which is double-click, opens up a virtual machine in the cloud for you, and you can start playing with Windows 10 without having to install it. And we can share and fix issues collaboratively in, in real time. That's like JS Bin, JS Fiddle, Code Pen, these kind of things. It's amazing how you can help somebody out when they have a problem with their site, saying like, can you put in a Code Pen, make it the easiest version? Okay, it's still broken, let's code together and fix that thing. Rather than like sending an email back and forward trying to explain what you done wrong and wasting each other's time. Automization and optimization is a big thing as well. We got task runners, we got package managers, we got pre, post compilers and transpilers, ES6 like Babel.js to, to use ES6 now in all browsers. Uh, we've got cross-platform conversion tools. For example, Manifold.js allows you to build uh, to use a, uh, to use a manifest file in XML and generate an iOS and an Android binary file, a binary app from your HTML5 application. Uh, PhoneGap did that for some while as well. So instead of just writing for each platform, you can convert it to those platforms. And you already have elite starters. You don't have to be part of that group because releasing and tooling publicly is the norm. It's a great advertising for Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, all the people out there to give their tools out. Facebook's React, for example, GitHub's Bootstrap. Everybody became that they, they realized they can hire a lot of developers by giving out software that is open and free because it, they share the knowledge and when people come and start work for the company they are already in the know because they use those tools. You could even say that competitive race in this world is much like the cracking scene was. There's like, I mean there's the, the drinking game, just type any word into, into Google and if you find word.js you have to drink. And almost every word nowadays is some JavaScript library. And there's no shortage of hype. People are getting very excited about everything. Like, no, it was broccoli, no gulp, no grunt. You have to use this tool, that tool, or you're not cool and you're not modern. On uh, 1st of April, I released redact.js, which is yeah, blatantly stealing the React uh, uh, logo. Uh, what redact.js promised you to do is your simple way to buttery smooth 60 frame per second performance even on mobile. It was just a JavaScript that you put in the bottom of your page and I compared that, for example, on um, without Redact, you would have like uh, 99 milliseconds rendering and 158 painting. And with Redact.js, you had 16 uh, milliseconds rendering and 1.4 milliseconds painting. So it was only a one-eighth of the rendering time, which means your, your app is eight times smoother than before. It's open source and on GitHub. And of course, you have to finish your website with Made with Love in somewhere nowadays, because otherwise it would not be a released website. <laughs> As it was April Fool's, it was, of course, bullshit. Um, the whole code was uh, add, add event listener, DOM content loaded, function body inner HTML equals nothing. So if you take the display of your application away, then it performs much better, It was my logic was, because nothing can slow down the browser any longer. And people were like, okay, it doesn't work, it doesn't show anything. Yeah, it does work, that's what it does. Mm -hmm. And a few people sent me pull requests and went in on the joke and I'm like, oh, I saved two tabs so it's now even smaller because it's only 86 bytes and not like 88 bytes. You were wasting so much time and effort. And I was thinking, okay, that was it. Like, haha, first of, July, uh, first of April. On the 10th of April, the German PHP magazine, which is a print magazine and also an online magazine, ran an article about redact.js being a great library to use to make your mobile systems much, much faster. So the tech press doesn't even read our stuff anymore. They just <laughs> believe the first sentence that we put in there. And they made a massive long article about it. It's like, oh, it's only 83 bytes and you should probably use it. And we, we wouldn't be surprised if Google's going to buy it in the future. They can still can if they want to. I don't mind. <laughs> and we're getting all excited and impressed about one another with amazing tools. And the only problem is that most of our tools never get used in real productions. 
because we're too busy writing the next tool. And that's just is something that I think we're wasting a lot of time on right now. The web is losing quality. Uh, I love this, this tweet, how to browse the mobile web, navigate to the site, close modal pop-up, decline native app offer, close top banner, close bottom banner. And it happens all the time. Companies like, oh, you just loaded 50 meg on your really slow connection. Don't you want to download the 150 meg app instead? Like, no, I want to see the site that I just loaded. But people just love apps because they can control the interface and give us things that you want to have. The average web page is two megabyte with, up, uh, with over 100 requests. And that's just mental. Because we've been doing so many like uh, performance talks telling you how to how to make things smaller and how to make your things more performing. And you think 2 meg is not much, but then I was in Albania the other day and my mobile phone from England told me that roaming is 12 gigabyte per 10 megabyte. Uh, 12, 12 gigabyte, 12 English pound for 10 megabyte, which means loading a 2 megabyte website is 3.32 euro, just to load the page, not navigate the whole site. Just the first page would cost me like three euros to look at your spinning picture of your great, uh, great restaurant, how it looks like, rather than me being able to order uh, any food. Maladjusted pricing is what I call that. Because we're wasting people's money and we're wasting people's time. And just because we use lots of libraries and we do lots of cool things to build our websites with. I just, uh, I just had a website of a, of a conference that I forked on GitHub because I want to do a known conference. And it was like, uh, it was like two meg of, of files. I'm like, oh, that's good with all the images and whatever. And then I started the NPM install to run the local host because every website has to come with its own server now. And 17 minutes later on my two gigabit connection that I have in Sweden, 17 minutes later I get 340 megabyte at 37,000 files. And it's a static website. There's nothing going on in that. It's just one HTML file in the end. And I was just like, this, what are we doing here? We're getting too excited about our own technology. This is not dealer quality software, as Triad used to call their uh, releases. And there's no technical excuse. If you have a website and you haven't done it yet, go to webpagetest.org and type in the website. You can select a server from all over the world to load that website from. And then you can also select which browser you want the website to be, uh, to be rendered in, which includes mobile browsers like iPads, iPods. I don't have any Apple hardware except for this. So I, I always test my iPod and iPhone stuff this way. And then you get a performance uh, report from your website. What was the content of your website? What was loaded? The first view and then the view after it has been cached. You have full insight even as to how much you, the, uh, the, the core of the computer and how much the processor was, was busy. Whenever there's an F, you did something very, very wrong and explains to you how to fix that as well. There's no excuse for slow websites out there. It's just that we put lots of magical tools in place and hope that the outcome is amazing rather than really testing what we're doing. And web page test even gives you a video showing how long it takes to load a certain website before it comes responsive, before it actually gives you the information that you want. And the, the general rule of thumb is like three seconds after that people get edgy on a mobile phone, like what's going on and reload the page instead of waiting for it any longer. And uh, many, many pages that I'm using are like 23, 25, uh, uh, 25 seconds at least. And that's why, for example, yesterday uh, uh, Facebook announced that instant articles that articles on an iPhone or an iPad are now rendered inside Facebook rather than on the web because the web is too slow. The web is not too slow. Our connections are actually quite good. We just put far too much stuff on the web. We just, we just fill it up with things that are obviously so necessary for us. They're focusing much more on tooling and how to many magical solutions in one place. And I look at that. We obviously have a new tool. And I'm like, oh, it's nice and fluffy. So let's touch it and see what it is. And then it turns out to be lots and lots of spiders that go on our server and do bad things. We should be concentrating on creating amazing end products. And we stop doing that. We stop thinking about the end product. We start thinking about what library should I use. I need to use React to make a fast website. I need to use Angular to make a fast website because reasons. Not because end users want to have that, because we want to solve our problem. 
And I think it's time we started analyzing the content that goes on the web and then build our solutions from that content. Maybe that's a single page website, maybe it's an app, maybe it's an HTML page, a normal one, a static one. But instead of having say like, we need this and do this because better tools make better developers, I don't think so. Um, experience and also being, uh, being excited and being interested is what makes us better developers. How does something work? How do I repeat it for myself? How do I make it maintainable? How do I document it? How do I give it to other people? And not winning Hacker News for one day. This is the Flight Arcade, which is a game that was released on Build, which, uh, of course, I work for Microsoft, but I, I opened it on my Mac in, uh, in, in my Firefox, which is still my main browser, and it works. And that is quality. That is not like, oh, please download our browser because it's the fastest and this demo only works in that browser because our end users don't have the choice. They normally cannot go to another browser or they have, should have a really, really good reason to go to another browser because your website only works in one. This thing integrates with, uh, uh, with Xbox Live and it also has like game controller support and all these kind of things. And it's going to be on GitHub and I love that, that a company like Microsoft releases that now, and Firefox as well, Chrome releases all their stuff out there. So look at these things and analyze them and reverse engineer them. Make a cracked version if you wanted to, it's free, so it's not really one. But it's quite fun to see, like, how can I stop dying in this game? How did the game do that? Analyze the things instead of just being frustrated and saying, like, I'm not as clever, I cannot build something like that. Everything on the web is for you to play with and to do something uh, wonderful with it. So let's create some tool releases for the web. And I'm not caring if it's an app, I'm not caring if it's a website, they all follow the same rules. They should work cross-platform and input independent. If I need a mouse or I need a tap, uh, a touch screen to use your thing, think about people who cannot use a mouse, think about people who don't have a mobile phone but have to use a keyboard for everything, because that's what people have out there. Perform jank free at, uh, jank free at any sensible frame rate, it's always 60 frames per second is the thing that you have to reach, but not all the time. Like, as soon as it actually looks familiar enough, I mean, most of my native apps don't run on 60 frames per second, and I deal with it because, okay, I want to use that thing right now. So don't get too excited if it doesn't perform perfectly on iOS and all the Android devices out there. Are small and simple and enhance when possible. The, one, the whole thing about going to mobile should have made our interfaces much, much easier because we don't have much screen estate. But instead, we make things still totally complex. Look at LinkedIn on desktop now. I mean, I don't even know what I'm interacting with anymore. There's 10,000 things in there. Another feature. Yeah, you probably want to see videos of this person you never met and you want to connect to the random people that we offer to you rather than to the people that ask to connect with you. So if you contact me on LinkedIn, I probably will not find you. Sorry. But you can enhance when possible. Start with something simple. I mean, Google had that, had that down to a par when they came out. One search box. Whereas Yahoo had like, oh, here's cars, photos, celebrities, things, and a search. Google said like one search box, and then it became more and more after time when people wanted to have more, and people wanted to have more functionality. So think about that core first, and then make it amazing. Use device storage to deliver repeated content fast. This doesn't have to be an app. Local storage, IndexedDB is available across all browsers now. So instead of your website continuously loading the same things over and over again from your server, why don't you store it on your user's computer and next time they come, poof, it's already there. People are not expecting this. People have been so disillusioned by, uh, by websites not being offline available that they, never, that, they just, that they send you emails like, whoa, this thing was so fast, thank you. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's local storage is called that way. So if people use things over and over again, store them. You've got 5 megabyte up to 10 megabyte to, you, to play with on every mobile and every desktop machine out there. And it's just window local storage key value. It's that easy to use. So don't get too excited about that. Uh, don't get too disillusioned about that when you see like, oh, local storage is slow. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. We are very good at writing articles blaming our technology to be broken rather than writing articles of how to use it. All the articles how to use technology is like, use my framework, because I've got a framework that fixes everything magically for you. And browsers get better over time as well. The broken local storage from, from five years ago in Firefox now works nicely in Firefox. Just keep up to date with that. Things should work offline. We're pushing in that direction. App cache is a solution that works. It's not perfect, of course. No software ever is. 
service worker is coming and is very, very exciting, but also is running the danger of becoming much more complex than it should be. We had the same with local storage. Local storage was slow, so people came with index DB. So instead of having a key value pair store, we now expect people to understand what a database is about and set up a database and do everything. With Service Worker, we realized that storing things offline is, is not easy to do. And now with Service Worker, we're like, okay, you've got to know the whole HTTP stack and write your own proxy in JavaScript. Which is cool when you know how to do it, but quite daunting when you look at it and you just, I just wanted to store some pictures offline. What do I do now? All browsers get what they can sensibly display. People think they have to support all browsers with the same functionality that they have to support the new ones. No. Give people something that works. If an Internet Explorer 6 or 7 reloads the page instead of having a single page app, uh, app experience, that's fine. People on these computers are not used to beautiful things. Don't confuse them. Let them, do the, let them use the things they've been using for the last 20 years because otherwise they get angry anyways. Load dependencies on demand. Don't load everything up front. If, the, if there's a picture gallery like five levels down in your navigation on your website, load those images when they're needed, not in the index page. Give me as much information as fast as possible and only load the other things when they can be applied. Also test if the browser can do something before you load functionality that is relying on this. So instead of just saying like, okay, we need CSS animation, let's do the CSS animation JavaScript library, test if animation is available and only load when it's not, otherwise use the CSS animation. Offer only as much as needed. Like we have to make the web smaller, we have to make the web faster because we cluttered it. We put more ads than content on the web and complain that people don't go there. Well, I wouldn't go and show, look at ads instead of reading a book that I downloaded. The web is the most versatile and non-elite platform. It's like everybody is, has the same rights, everybody has the same access. There's a few companies that want to change that, but we're fighting that. So it's up to you to go and make your mark, much like I did, just by finding a floppy disk and then becoming a guy who actually wrote these kind of games. So, F. Caristo, that's me.